Another episode of Words of Grace starts now, featuring a new grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. Hello everyone, I am excited for today's message coming straight to you from John chapter 9. So let's get right into it, starting at verse 1. It says, as he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. What really has struck me in this story is that even before we get into this incredible part of healing that takes place and, and the strange way that Jesus did it, is these next two verses because people still have the same question today. And uh, it's like, haven't you read John chapter 9 before? And I'm speaking about spiritual leaders in the church today. So verse 2 says this. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now remember, the answer to this man's problem is right there with them. Jesus can heal this man. The man has lived his entire life blind. Instead of saying, let's heal this man, uh, they want to focus on what caused this man's blindness. Was it his sins or the sins of his parents? They're focused on the issue instead of the solution that is right there with them. Now that's human nature. I, I have an issue. Well, what caused it? Why do I still have this issue? Instead of, Jesus is with me. So the disciples, they think they're really smart. They think they have an answer. It's got to be one of these two things. I know why he's blind. It's because either A, he sinned, or B, his parents sinned, or maybe it's a combination of the two. The, the problem here is that this theology persists in our world today even from the church leaders. And of course, if the church leaders believe it, it's going to filter through to their congregations. Uh, there was one mega televangelist who told his TV audience that the earthquake in Haiti was caused by its people's pact with the devil. It's unbelievable even to, to hear that out loud. Uh, following the devastating attack of 9-11, another televangelist said, that 9-11 occurred because of pagans, abortionists, feminists, the gays and the lesbians, and the ACLU. Uh, with Hurricane Katrina, there was another famous mega-pastor who said, I believe that the New Orleans, had a, New Orleans had a level of sin that was offensive to God, and they were just recipients of the judgment of God for that. I mean, are, are you kidding me? They're saying, I know why a bunch of innocent people die. They sinned or their parents sinned. Have they not read John chapter 9? This same junk theology that the disciples had at this moment in time in their life, it has persisted throughout the church through history, and it continues today. So what I want to do is, as we're in John 9, is I want to listen to the voice of grace. I want you to hear what Jesus Christ has to say, and his response to them, and then what does he do? So we'll see that. Uh, let's go, to, go together in the text. It says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened, the reason this happened, is so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. That's John 9, 3. So God didn't send a hurricane to teach a bunch of people a lesson, but even in bad things, God can use them together for our good so that the works of God might be displayed. They want an explanation for this man's blindness, and Jesus gives it to them. But they, they ask for this explanation in the categories of cause. What is it in his past that caused the blindness? But Jesus says, no, no that's not going to work. He gives them an explanation in the category of purpose instead of cause. Jesus says, in effect, that specific sins in the past don't always correlate with specific suffering 
in the present. So you can't say that these people uh, suffered because of their sin. This hurricane came because it doesn't work. But instead, the decisive explanation for this blindness is not found by looking for its cause, but instead looking for its purpose. And the purpose is so that the works of God might be displayed in Him. It's not that suffering didn't come into the world because of sin. I want to be clear. It did. I'm not arguing that, that Suffering isn't a result of sin. Obviously, if sin never entered the world, there'd be no suffering, there'd be no death, no sickness, none of that stuff. That's plain from Genesis 3 and Romans 8, 18 through 25. If there was never sin, the world would not have suffering. All suffering is a result of sin entering the world. That's true. We feel the effects, even as uh, being Christ followers, as children, uh, daughters, sons and daughters of God, we feel these effects living in a fallen world. But the explanation of the blindness lies not in the past causes, but in the future purposes. For Jesus, blindness from birth is sufficiently explained by saying that God intends to display some of his glory through this blindness. In this case, the glory of God will be revealed through his healing. That God has the power to heal. So Jesus continues, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. John 9, 4 through 5. When Jesus says these words, the night is coming, it's a little like the theatrical moment in Games of Thrones, Game of Thrones, where over and over again they say, winter is coming. Or, I mean, just take any other movie. Uh, where there's some serious foreshadowing going on. Think of the Scooby-Doo episodes where they pull up to the mansion and there's lightning and thunder. Night is coming. When Jesus said that, he was only about six months after this event took place that our Lord was crucified. Night was coming. It's very likely that when Jesus spoke these words, that the day was almost over and night was closing in. In this case, Adam Clark commentary says, Day represents the opportunity, whereas night is the loss of that opportunity. Before us now is an opportunity to bring healing and sight to the blind, because Jesus is the light of the world, and he lives in us. John 9, 5. You see, Jesus didn't get sucked into this blame game, and he doesn't want us to either. Well, why did this happen? I think it's this. I think it's that. I think this person sinned. That person sinned. What sin has caused this? Forget about what you should or shouldn't have done. Don't focus on the why it happened. Be preoccupied instead with your solution to your problem. Jesus Christ, who through the cross has removed every sin in our lives, and who wants to work a miracle in our bodies. The opportunity is before us, so that God might be glorified through our lives. After saying this, he spat on the ground and made some mud with the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes, John 9, 6. I told you, this is wild. This is so wild. You're blind. So let's go ahead and double up on that blindness. Let's make even more blind. I know that's not possible, but if you're blind, let's put another layer on of mud. Uh, and, and, and so that you really can't see. And we don't know the level of his blindness. He was born blind. Perhaps maybe he could barely make out shadows or something. You know, there's levels of blindness. But with the mud on his over his eyes, he couldn't see a thing. We know that for sure. And so I want to say thank God that what creation cannot do, redemption can and did. Jesus demonstrated this when he spit on the ground. This is why he does this. He made clay with his saliva and he puts it on the blind man's eyes. So why did Jesus do that? He was demonstrating to us that all of our body parts come from the ground. Genesis 2, 7 tells us that. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. And because creation has fallen, remember I said suffering did come as a result of sin entering the world. Because creation has fallen, the work of creation cannot open a blind man's eyes. 
But the work of redemption can. That's why he sent the man to the pool of Siloam. So now, here's a picture of the pool of Siloam. And uh, this is a picture taken from the year 2004. It's a real place. It's a real place. You can visit it today. The word here, Siloam, means sent. And so referring to the sent one, Jesus, when the blind man washed his eyes in the pool of the sent one, he received supernatural healing for his eyes. You can see the message is clear. That when we go to Jesus, the sent one who came to redeem us with the price of his blood, and we rest in his finished work, we too will receive the miracle that we need. If we believe that by his stripes we are healed, we will have greater health than those who trust in creation alone. I just got to say it this way. Diets are great. They're great. Exercise is wonderful. Eat well. Take care of yourself. Get a lot of rest. But there is only so much that the natural can do for us. Our supernatural healing, health to our bodies, is available through the one who was sent and redeemed us from every curse that came upon creation with the fall of Adam. That's what Galatians 3.13 says. He has redeemed us from sickness. He has redeemed us from pain and sorrow, depression, poverty, and even death. The world may know him as creator, but today we know him as our redeemer. Where the work of creation cannot save us, his work of redemption can and has. So after the miracle happens in this man's life, there are five conversations that take place that move him to spiritual salvation. Now, if you've been with us long enough, you know that the number five represents grace. That is the, the numerology in the Hebrew. Whenever there's five things that appear in the Bible, it is a message of grace. And so there's five conversations to be had, and this, it shows that the grace of God is at work in this man's heart, this former blind man's heart, because God doesn't desire just for physical healing. He desires for this man's spiritual salvation, too. And so John Piper actually makes a note of these five conversations in a great sermon that he preached entitled, The Works of God and the Worship of Jesus. And so the first conversation is clear. You see this in verses 8 through 12. It is a conversation that takes place between the, the blind man that was healed and his neighbors because they're just blown away by what's happened. They've only known him since he was born as being blind, and all of a sudden, one day, he's not blind. His neighbors who and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Isn't that the guy that we've always known who could never see? You know, some claimed that he was. Others are saying, no, <laughs> it couldn't be. He only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. I'm that same guy you've always known. Verse 10, it says, how then, they asked, how then were your eyes open? He replies in verse 11, the man, this is so key. This is the first time he refers to Jesus. He calls him the man. You see, there is a progression that is going to take place in his, in his life and in his heart. And we can see this happen in people's lives today that we are praying for. If you'll see this progression, that God is working in their heart. And so he begins, he says, there's this man who did it. They call him Jesus. So he actually knows his name. He made some mud and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked. I don't know. So at this point, he's just referring to Jesus as the man in John 9, 11. He knows his name, but he doesn't even know. He's, I don't know, there's this guy. So he has a ways to go. Everybody in history will at least begin by acknowledging that Jesus was a man. 
Conversation number two. Remember I said we've got five of them. We're on number two. This is a conversation that happens between the former blind man and the Pharisees in verses 13 through 17. You can go ahead and track this right through John 9. Uh, it's, I love how this is laid out, how all five just flow. It says, they brought to the Pharisee the man who had been blind. Verse 14 says, now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Aha, we've got him. He's doing a work on the Sabbath. The Pharisees are thinking this. We've got Jesus in something. They want to question and they really want to trap Jesus here. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. Here it is, couldn't be from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked him, how can a sinner perform such signs? What a, what a great question. So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man in verse 17. What have you to say about him? Remember, he started, Jesus is a man. It was your eyes he opened. The man replies, he doesn't call Jesus a man. He takes it a step further. He says, he is a prophet. Something has happened in this interchange, and something is happening in this man's heart. And we can see it unfold right here. He answers in verse 17, he's a prophet. Not just an ordinary man, but one who is sent by God. He's a prophet. So we're getting closer. He's not just a man. He's got to at least be a prophet. So that, that's conversation two. Now we're moving into conversation three. And I just love the progression that's laid out here. You see how unique this is? Because now this third conversation actually isn't going to include the former blind man. It's going to be between the Pharisees and his parents. This is verses 18 through 23. So they still not, did not believe that he has been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. And in verse 19, they say, is this your son? They asked. Because the parents would know if that's their son that was born blind. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? They, they ask the parents. The Pharisees do. Verse 20. This is something we know. They're going to start with something they know. We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know that he was born blind. You see, they have a ways to go in. Who is Jesus? And what did he come to do? And what did he do in our son's life? And who is he? Is he the Messiah? And so in verse 21, they say, but uh, how can he see now? Or who opened his eyes? This is the question the Pharisees want to know. We don't know. Ask him. He's not a baby. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. They've already spoken to him. Verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They don't want to get in trouble by pronouncing that Jesus is this, or Jesus is that, or whatever. Uh, they, uh, and so, so they're afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who had acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue, and so they would be publicly humiliated. They would receive a slap on the cheek. They would not be allowed to worship anymore with their friends and family members if they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So they, they don't want to go that, that way. They don't want to be put out of the synagogue. So they're like, talk to our son. You know, leave us out of this. And, and that's why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So combo four, uh, part two, between the beggar and the Pharisees. And so they're going to go back to him. And this is verses 24 through 34. And so this is great. And the fourth conversation... We see the full-blown courage of this former blind man. He's a past blind beggar, and he is standing up to the most religious and educated people of the land. And then we'll see in this interaction the full-blown blasphemy of the Pharisees. A second time, they summon the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. The power of your testimony of what Jesus did in your life, it cannot be refuted. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? 
How do you have your eyes, oh, how did he open your eyes? What a great question for us to stop and reflect on. How did we have our spiritual eyes open to see Jesus for who he is? The truth about Jesus was going deeper all the time. The former blind man's spiritual sight is getting stronger. He is seeing more and more, and his courage becomes scorn at the hands of the Pharisees, or the words of the Pharisees. Verse 27. Why do you want to hear my story again? Do you all, what a zinger. Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> And now they became hostile. Verses 28 through 29. They didn't like hearing that. You're asking a lot about him. What do you want to follow him yourself? So they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, speaking of Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. The controversy exposes another deceit. They're not disciples of Moses. They think they are because they're living according to the law. But Jesus said clearly in John 5, 46, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Now we start to see who is really blind in this story. This man's courage for Jesus continues to grow in verses 30 through 33. The man answered, Now, that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is simply astonishing what has happened in this man's soul. They can't handle it. So they cast him out with contempt. Verse 34, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. This man is no longer allowed to enter the synagogue. So that would have been possibly a little devastating in that moment. But we have combo five, number for grace, is about to enter this man's life. And it, it, is, it is amazing what transpires. So in enters Jesus, who is the very grace of God. And this conversation now is between Jesus and the former blind man. And the one thing that makes it so significant is that Jesus initiates it. The man has been threatened, and he's cast out of his lifelong religious community. But Jesus seeks him and finds him. And it's no accident that in the next chapter is about Jesus as the shepherd who gathers his sheep. Because this is exactly what he's doing here. So let's look at verses 35 through 38. All our seeing and all our healing is owning to new spiritual life that comes from Jesus. I want you to remember that as we get into verse 35. Jesus heard that they cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, remember it was a progression. And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? I'm at this point in my life. I've gone through some things that God has orchestrated. And I'm at this point where I'm ready to believe. And that's, this is the very last thing that we see or hear of this former blind man. And this is the point of the story. Jesus does the works of God. Jesus is the glory of God. This man was blind. He was physically in need of salvation, but more importantly, he needed to have his spiritual eyes open to see Jesus for who he is. It was five conversations that led to this point in time. He first called Jesus the man. Then he calls Jesus the prophet. And he still has questions. Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see. And those who see will become blind. 
What an incredible story that teaches us that what creation cannot do, restore sight to a blind man's eyes, redemption can and has. In Jesus, there is healing, wholeness, deliverance. Jesus, the light of the world, has come to open the spiritual and the physical eyes of the blind. As we think about the salvation that we have received, there is a powerful testimony that we have to share. While it is day and the opportunity is before us, let us let the light of Christ shine from us so that others may receive his salvation too. The story shows that even when the miraculous takes place in someone's life, it doesn't necessarily mean that they fully understand it and even have received spiritual salvation immediately from it. So don't get discouraged. I've had this happen where I've been praying for someone, something miraculous happens, and they still are like, well, was, was that God? Or was that just random? Or what happened? And they have these other questions, and, and they're on this journey, but God's love continues to pursue them. You know, physical salvation can be what leads to spiritual salvation in someone else's life, like it was here in the former blind beggar's life. Sometimes it will, it will take God using other conversations and circumstances that will begin to lead this person to faith. The good news is that salvation is a work of God. And the next chapter shows that our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, loves his sheep so much that he gave his life for us, and any who enter into, into Jesus, who is the gate, the promise is they will be saved. So with that, would you go with me to prayer, uh, to God in prayer, and just lift up those that we've been praying for in our past, who are taking that journey, and they're getting closer and closer to receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. May you be used as an instrument Maybe one of those conversations that nudges them closer, or maybe actually the Holy Spirit uses for their eyes to be open and for them to finally come to know Jesus as Messiah. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are doing a work in all of our lives. We're together on this mission, and I am excited that I get to be a part of it. Now, as we plant seeds, uh, there will be others that will come and water it and, and see different stages of growth. And we know that salvation is a work of God to begin with. But you use us as instruments, vessels of your grace. And I am so grateful for that. I pray that this message will encourage men and women in their own faith to see that today is a day, it's an opportunity to bring Christ into someone else's world. Lord, I thank you that the pressure is taken off of us because we know that salvation is not, is, does not come uh, from us. It comes as a work of God, but we are partakers of bringing it forth and being able to celebrate uh, when it transpires. Uh, so, Lord, I pray that we don't lose heart on those that we've been praying for for so long. And maybe they're only uh, where this man was at in conversation two. Uh, or, or, you know, conversation four, not all the way there. Uh, may we be encouraged that much more through this story because I know that you love them so much more than even we do. And so your desire is for their salvation. So Lord, may you use us as instruments of your grace. May you use other people to be brought forth into their life to lead them to salvation. I thank you for the timeliness of this message what the Holy Spirit will do through it. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.